Welcome to the first in a series of videos going through Martin Heidegger's great philosophical text, Being in Time, one section at a time. Now, this is part of a broader series of videos I will be doing with um, Daniel. I'll resume tomorrow the group reading of Being in Time. Tomorrow we'll be talking about the third chapter on the world, so tune in tomorrow, 8 a.m. Indian time. But I also wanted to uh, do, in addition to the discussion, um, and the dialogue with him and whoever else is interested in joining, by the way. I also wanted to do a series of videos that examine this text at a greater level of detail in that it is one of, obviously, the greatest philosophical works of all time, but it's also one of those works which is re um, reputed by everyone who reads it to be so obscure at the sort of line-by-line -line basis. I really, I think you will benefit a great deal from doing a much more detailed analysis of the text. So I'm going to try to go through every section of the book, starting in this video with the introduction. Now, I think that Being in Time is one of those books which, as much as I try to make this a video about just the introduction, um, this video is not going to have the character of some of the other videos I've done, which provide the overview of the whole book. Um, like the first video I did on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit that you could find on this channel um, back in the archives, really had to present the, um, the structure of the whole book, Phenomenology of Spirit, in one video before I began the, um, the linear work going through section by section and I thought about doing something similar for being in time but I decided to instead focus on the introduction but it's one of those books which you have to have some rough overview of especially if you've never read it before you know I'm talking about in this slide so the big thing he wants to do here is reawaken the question of being now being is one of those things which although it's been a uh, major theme of philosophy all the way back to the ancient Greeks, it's become a question that has become a problem even to pose anymore. For us, it's not just the answer to the question of being is obscure, it's that for us, even being able to formulate the question of being requires something of a reawakening. And although this stems from a few issues, one of them being, of course, the sort of historically transmitted ontology which we've inherited from the ancient world, which although it was a serious response to a problem that they had to work out themselves. Uh, for us, it's simply been handed over historically as a tradition and then dogmatized into this dry system of concepts, this dry technical system, which prevents us from even reawakening the question. It also stems from, he thinks, the um, confusion between the sense of being in itself or being qua being versus the minor use of the word being in the sense that most of the time when we think we're talking about being, we're actually talking about beings. And the big theme in Heidegger that being is not a being requires you to move away from the traditional tendency to impose um, an understanding and analysis of being itself to the resources of, say, categorical analysis, or even in Husserl's terms, the formal ontology, which considers um, any object whatsoever in contrast with, of course, Husserl's material ontology, which does make the distinction between um, distinct regions of being. You have the region of, say, uh, physical spatial temporal objects, and then you have the region of psychic events, etc. Um, and, of course, you still have this um, formal ontology of any object whatsoever, which Heidegger does visit in Being in Time. He doesn't consider that to be going far enough because it still is treating the question of being by doing this formal ontology in terms of the anonymous any object whatsoever as a, a being rather than as being itself. And the other uh, mistakes that we tend to make when trying to talk about being is to treat it as either an empty universal or maybe just the highest in a long um, tree of genuses. Whereas for him, the uh, appropriate way to approach being is to get away from the metaphor of objectivity or the metaphors of generality that you tend to use to talk about being, um, which are much more appropriate to the, to the lower notion of beings, and instead to talk about this radical notion of disclosure. He gives the famous metaphor of a clearing in the woods, and the clearing in the woods metaphor is something you have to keep in mind. It's not just the things in the clearing, as you see this image on the screen. It's not just the things in the clearing. It's not just this sort of inductive notion of building up the set of stuff and trying to understand that set of stuff, that set of objects holistically. It's rather trying to transcend the very metaphor 
metaphysics of having to be an object or an entity, and instead considering the clearing in the woods in itself. And therefore, the big emphasis is going to shift from having the right categorical concepts to talk about objects, which is, of course, the big theme in Aristotle, the big theme in Kant, um, and big theme in Husserl, still focusing on formal ontology dealing with categories, and instead to talk about things like the horizon of interpretation. If you shift from being held hostage to objectivity to instead being able to talk about something like the radical disclosure, which is like the clearing in the woods. You're moving um, from objective content, I think, of the things to instead this notion of interpretation. Interpretation as that which is maybe the correlate of a horizon of meaningfulness. And therefore, the distinction of Dasein is that Dasein um, is able to relate to the question which I just mentioned is in need right now, or at least it was in Heidegger's time, of being reawakening, uh, re being reawakened, there we go. Um, but it relates to that question, not just as a question about objectivity, but it relates to that question as the concern about being and about its own being. And I'll have a lot more to say about that, but first let me just make sure that the uh, live stream is working okay. Just had to make sure about that because the internet's a little um, inconsistent here in India. So the big distinction which might drive you crazy the first time you read Being in Time is all of this talk about ontic and ontological. Now that's kind of just fancy terminology for the difference between say physical real factual existence, which is the mere thinghood of an ontic being. If you see the um, image at the top of just a physical object, like a Rubik's cube, right? And that's something which most of the history of um, trying to talk about being has gotten caught up in the illusion that the traditional categories to talk about objectivity are going to be the main concern of talking about being. So for Aristotle, the categories are, of course, ordered in the set of substance, quality, quantity, relation, and then the higher categories. But obviously, substance is the primary one. And Aristotle's notion of substance is really something like that foundation of objectivity upon which the higher order categories are sort of um, built on top of that foundation. But um, really, it's built still on this notion that uh, submitting ca uh, the, the physical object to a categorical analysis is going to be an adequate answer to the question of what is being. Obviously for Kant later we get a more sophisticated um, taxonomy of categories in that for Kant, quality isn't just one category, quantity isn't just one category, relation isn't just one category. Those are really headings under which these other categories go. So for Kant, substance isn't the ultimate category underlying. For Kant, rather substance is just one of the relational categories. Relation itself, by the way, is not just a category for Kant. It's a, it's a heading under which you have three possible instantiations of that category, just like there are three qualitative categories and it can only be instantiated by one of those three. For you might have something in Kant, like a universal, affirmative, categorical, apodictic, um, a sort of combination of instantiations, a modality dealing with the level of necessity with which something is given. Something might be given as um, absolutely necessary, um, and therefore the modality, the necessity is also a category which Aristotle largely leaves out. Um, and that's impressive, but that is something you apply to a sort of traditional categorical analysis of objects. That's stuck within the ontic, as, um, as, as Heidegger would say, whereas ontology is this word which, although it's of ancient Greek origin, um, or, you know, etymologically speaking, it still is something which is coined, I think like in the 17th century, talking about, you know, like scholastic philosophy. And the ontological is not the question of a particular entity submitted in its thinghood to categorical analysis, but rather it's Dasein's ability to question its own being, at least for Heidegger, that's what we're talking about when we say ontolo ontology, the fundamental ontology is getting at the question of being rather than being stuck in this analysis of beings. And Dasein has a unique position there because it's, a, it's able not just to question being, it's able to question its own being. And therefore, Dasein is going to have a priority over the others. But of course, there is a history of trying to grapple in one way or another, maybe incompletely, maybe confusedly, with the ontological question of being. Of course, Plato, we have being qua being, 
is the forms for Aristotle. It's substance, you know, it's this answer to the difference in Aristotle between, you know, the, the sort of lower form of being, which is merely the being of privations and negations. You could say something like, um, you know, um, Nietzsche is not alive still. You have this negation with is, but of course that's not the same is as when you're really talking about the being of substance. Um, you know, of course, for Thomas Aquinas, you have sort of the notion of being largely having to do with actuality because for him having to deal with God as a much higher kind of being than the material beings, God simply is the perfect definition of being, yet he's not really like a physical object. So therefore for Thomas Aquinas, being largely has a lot more to do with the difference between potentiality and actuality. So if God is already fully actualized, he can't become more fully actualized. This is why for Thomas Aquinas, if God's already fully perfect, he can't become more fully perfect. You've misunderstood what perfection is, as I talk about in my book. And therefore, for Thomas Aquinas, it's really more actuality even now than it is just the sort of substantiality of thinghood. And that's fine. Of course, for Hegel, it's a notion. Notion is this idea that um, getting beyond the picture thinking of forms of this or that thing given to intuition, instead considering notion. Notional thinking is the big um, theme of phenomenology of spirit, the errors of incomplete perspectives along the pathway of phenomenology of spirit largely are people making mistakes you know these characters within phenomenology of spirit they make mistakes by thinking picture thinking rather than thinking notionally and therefore for hegel being kind of is tied up into notion you know um, um what is overlaps with what is notional uh, being overlaps with thought different ways of talking about hegel of course for nietzsche it's uh, will to power being insofar as it's being is will to power. Therefore, for Nietzsche, you have either the affirmation of the will to power or you have its negation. You either have affirmation of life or you have nihilism. And it's an adequate response to the question, well, what is being while being? It's just will to power. But all of those take for granted, no matter how brilliant or monumental each one of those stances is in the history of philosophy, they all take for granted that being means something like presence. And therefore, for Heidegger, they're all caught up within a temporal interpretation, whether they realize it or not, something that was sort of rested difficultly um, uh, with great difficulty as a problem it came with this answer within the sort of horizon of interpretation that was temporal has now simply become a tradition that's transmitted historically down to us without even realizing it. If I want to talk about the text in greater depth, if you look at introduction one, necessity structure, priority of the question of being, um, he knows that being did occupy the ancient Greeks but has ceased to be a real topic of investigation, even for people who are still sort of doing ancient Greek studies. Um, and that's not because being is obvious. I mean, we have these, you know, um, notions that we don't question being because it's obvious. We all use it when we talk about predication. We all are able to form these nice little categorical statements like Aristotle is dead. Um, or we could say it's empty, you know, it's simply the highest level of maybe generality in this um, in this tree of this hierarchy of greater and greater um, levels of generality. It's simply the highest one, therefore you can't go any further. Um, but because a particular historically transmitted interpretation has been passed down to us and trivialized, we take for granted, not that we um, know nothing about being, but rather we take for granted that being simply is presence. And therefore, as I mentioned, there is an unspoken temporal component. But he asks, you know, there are three main prejudices that obstruct research into being. We either think that being is simply a universal, or we might think of it as having to have the same level of universality as one of the uh, regions of Husserl's material ontology. For him, material ontology is not one science, it's a set of regions which do not overlap. You have the region of physical, spatial, temporal objects. You have the region of psychic events, okay? Um, you have the region of uh, consciousness, but you um, are able to approach those regions in, term of, in terms of this type of universality that you get um, at the higher up you go within that sort of region, which is not applicable, he thinks, to um, to Dasein, uh, being just, Dasein is not just a region. In other words, being is maybe undefinable, says some people, um, and the resources of traditional logic to derive from higher concepts by way of lower ones, as I'm quoting him, is what leads some within the resources of traditional logic to say that being simply is undefinable. 
apply that way. Or maybe being self-evident, we all use it to make statements of predication, like Aristotle is dead. We all must know what being is if we're able to make statements like that. But being is not a being. It requires something other than the method of discovery of beings. And those are the kind of beings which traditional categories would apply because it's something which includes maybe a type of questioning rather than simply a, an intuitive discovery of objects. Dasein includes inquiry among its possibilities of being. And Dasein is the being which we ourselves are, has a relation to the question of being itself. And therefore, if I just check the... Uh, Okay, yeah, it looks like it's still going. Sorry, it's just one of those days where I am sort of legitimately uh, concerned about uh, the reliability of the uh, internet. Uh, so sorry for that interruption. Let me get back to this real quick. So if Dasein has a relation to the question of being, because for it, like Kierkegaard mentioned, having to exist is a problem. Kierkegaard sort of broke out of the traditional philosophical analysis of existence, meaning something like brute objectivity, and that for Kierkegaard, having to exist is a problem. You have to exist even before you have an understanding of what it is that you're existing as, in the sense of existentialism, existence precedes essence. Being is something you have, can have to do is a type of work. And of course, the mood that is disclosed, co-disclosed with that is a problem for Kierkegaard is things like anxiety, legitimate despair about the problem of having to exist. Um, and in a lot of ways, Heidegger is borrowing this insight from Kierkegaard to note that for Dasein, having the relation to the question of being itself largely comes from the concern about the being which we ourselves are. And yet, therefore, the um, presuppositions of other sciences in that um, a, another science's development is precisely correlated with its ability for a crisis at the foundation rather than its immunity from crisis at foundation, its um, ability to just proceed unproblematically in this linear sense. You find even with things like mathematics, um, the most secure supposedly of all the sciences actually has a shaking at its foundation, much like ACDC, as you see it fly on the wall, classic part of. We have this kind of shaking of foundation in relativity theory, um, mathematics intuition, and formalism. And of course, even in theology, you have, of course, Martin Luther was the original sort of shaking the foundations by asking whether the, the question of faith somehow gets left out of being the basis of the sprawling conceptual apparatus of theological terminology, which is not only surprisingly insufficient for dealing with the range of problems that theology should be treating, but actually covers over the serious problems with the obscurity of this um, sprawling set of technical terms and sort of getting us back to faith at the basis is what Martin Luther did. And yet Martin Luther's, uh, excuse me, uh, Martin Heidegger's own methodology is going to differ from that of traditional sciences in that for him, ontological inquiry is necessarily more original than the type of ontic inquiry of the positive sciences in which the positive sciences are largely built on having to discover objects and submit them to categorical analysis and use logic as a type of check on whether they're violating the law of non-contradiction. Yet for Heidegger, laying foundations is not simply the same as the type of reductive logic which limps behind and investigates in terms of methodological consistency. Rather for Heidegger, laying the foundations is something of a disclosure, a radical disclosure of the structures of thought, which provides the ability later for you to do that type of checking, which in the analytic a priori merely pretty much tells you if there's a violation of the law of non-contradiction, um, the analytic a priori judgment, all bodies are extended, just checks that there's not a contradiction there. Truth trees, as impressive and rigorous as they might be as these logical tools as you see on, on the side, largely also just check for contradictions. Um, they do it in a kind of an impressive way, but that's really what we're going down to. But Heidegger does not see that as the same as the type of radical disclosure of a structure that provides the ability for questions to be explored within science. And therefore, his 
Um, preference for Dasein over this, like all other things that he kind of mentions, is that Dasein is different from those other things in that it's concerned about its own being, and it also has to understand itself in its being. Therefore, Dasein is not just disclosure, it's also something of a disclosure to itself in which self-understanding has to become something of a problem. And yet self-understanding is not simply this um, transparency of objective meaning, rather self-understanding occurs through the problematic of its own thrown possibilities. Um, occurring self-understanding occurring within this problem of thrownness as will become much bigger deal later on within the book um leads him to emphasize this thing called existence um dasein does this self-understanding in terms of existence because existence is that to which dasein has to relate and the essence of dasein unlike the essence of a simple a uh, physical object cannot be specified by a what of material content, as Heidegger puts it, because at each instance, it not so much simply is radically co coinciding with its material content. Rather, at each instance, it has to be its being, and it has to be its being as its own. Okay, big emphasis later on in the type of its ownness of death, right? Um, the uh, being towards death is something which you have to do on your own. Nobody can do it for you, okay? And therefore, being in a world is going to take on this radically different perspective for Heidegger, a world not just being the set of stuff, uh, the set of objects, I should say, that are like arrayed out spatial and temporally within this thing like a globe. Now, being the world belongs essentially to Dasein, and being in the world is a type of radical challenge to the Cartesianism that treats the subject as um, like a mind full of ideas. You find this emphasis from Descartes all the way really to Kant of, you know, we have this notion of, of minds in like empiricism, uh, you know, like John Locke, uh, David, uh, Berkeley, Berkeley um, and, and David Hume, um, in which there's this type of acceptance of the idea that you have ideas in the head. But Heidegger deeply challenges that in that being in the world, goes beyond this interiority of subjective unfolding and rather forces you to acknowledge that you're out there in the world involved, uh, caught up in projects, all of the great stuff we're going to explore in much greater detail later on in the book. And therefore, uh, the priority of Dasein to other things should not be misinterpreted as just another expression of the Aristotelian soul. Now, I decided to just use a screenshot from my own video on Dei Anubhava Aristotle, which was one of the first videos I did on this channel back in April. Uh, check that video out, by the way, for a much fuller explanation. But if you can see my mouse, uh, the cursor, the notion in um, being in time of Dasein's priority over all other things, as he calls it, is that the ontological analysis of Dasein simply is fundamental ontology itself. If you, want, if you want to know the question, what is fundamental ontology? It's the ontological analysis of Dasein. Now that sounds maybe peculiar. I mean, is it just that Dasein is this in inclusivity of lower forms, the way that the soul is for Aristotle. So Aristotle notes that soul as a form of living things really gives you this type of hierarchy of inclusiveness in that the whatness of lower things is included in the higher forms of, of, of higher souls. So humans, for example, have the abilities of lower living things like we have the uh, vegetative properties of plants. And if you um, talk about somebody who's uh, been in a terrible accident and now they're in a vegetative state, you're using Aristotelian terminology without knowing it. You're saying that they've dropped down from all of these other abilities of living things down to the lowest common denominator. Uh, but of course, there's also locomotion and things like that, which animals have, but they don't have logos. And therefore, the soul is, for Aristotle, this type of inclusiveness of the whatness of lower things. And for Thomas Aquinas, this sort of gets adopted into the transcendental as the being whose nature is to meet with all other beings. But that's not really as this type of subjectivizing of the totality of beings, as I quote Heidegger, what he means by Dasein. Dasein is not just Aristotelian soul, which includes lower whatnesses. Rather, the priority of Dasein is built more into the way that um, for Dasein, the relation to being is something other than what you'd have with these lower objects. But th for that reason, correct access to Dasein is going to be a huge problem because it, it, it's paradoxically, ontically nearest we ourselves are it. And yet ontologically, it's the farthest. Okay? 
And that's because Dasein's there. And keep in mind, in German, Da means there, Sein means being. So Dasein being there, the there of Dasein is the open temporal disclosiveness. And yet you're going to have to approach it through everydayness rather than through the set of prescribed categories that you borrow from some fixed idea of being. And he ultimately thinks time is going to be the key to this. Um, time is that from which Dasein tacitly understands being because time gives you the horizon of interpretation of beings. And this notion again, so important for Heidegger of, inter of, of horizon and of course interpretation. I showed the image of horizon radically breaking away from the adoption of some set of categories that you derive from some fixed idea of being. What about time? I mean, common understanding of time is the big thing that Heidegger thinks that even if you're trying to talk about time the way Kant did um, or the way Aristotle did, um, you still have this common understanding of time, which thinks of time as spatial. We have this spatial metaphor of time, like a timeline, like, you know, we're moving along process of time and you occupying a moment within this unfolding, um, which treats time as something of a thing uh, like other things, right? But time itself is going to what, be what interests Heidegger, not things that occur within time. Um, it's not a historical occurrence which interests Heidegger, it's historicity. Historicity has this also, also this mysterious priority over historical occurrence. Because Dasein is as and what it already was, as I quote him. Dasein simply is caught up into a type of entanglement in world, entanglement in tradition, in which the past isn't this other object trailing behind it as an objectivity. The error, by the way, which even Sartre after sort of rewriting being in time makes that mistake still. If you read the temporality chapter of being and nothingness, he still treats the past as trailing behind. Dasein, however, is its past. You, you simply have to overcome the spatial metaphorization of time in order to appreciate this. And for our entanglement in tradition is precisely what makes Greek philosophy something that is no longer a problematic asking or questioning, but rather something so obvious as the sink to a mere material for reworking is the brilliant sort of um, metaphor that uh, Heidegger gives in being in time. Greek ontology was oriented towards whether we, we realize it or not, nature in terms of time, a presence. And he actually urges that uh, critique of pure reason is also doing the sort of answering about being in terms of nature. Um, of course, for the ancient Greeks, phusis means something a little different than what we mean by nature, the sort of um, abiding and emerging from out of itself. Um, but of course, that still has a temporal interpretation of time as presence. But it mistakes time as one being among many others. And even Kant's serious investigation into temporality, um, largely because of the phenomena themselves drove him to investigate time. So it leads to his um, notion of this sort of temporal synthesis in Kant um, that he noted it was a venture into obscurity. He was noting that, you know, it, you can't give a terribly satisfactory answer to something which necessarily is driving into obscurity. Um, but for him, that was because he failed to not adopt the Cartesian notion of uh, medieval dogmatization of ancient Greek perspective in that for Descartes, he had this revolution of, I think, therefore I am, but he didn't revolutionize the last bit of that. He did not revolutionize in um, cogito ergo sum. He did not revolutionize the sum part of that formula. He still took for granted that being, the kind of being of the Cartesian um, you know, uh, subject is a thing. Right, res cogitans literally means the thinking thing in Latin. Was he failed to question being, and he failed to not um, question the scholastic dogmatization of ancient Greek perspective. And therefore, for Heidegger, phenomenology is going to have to be ontology. Phenomenology is going to differ in that phenomenology occupies the unique perspective of investigating the showing of itself. If you look at the literal etymology of phenomenology, um, the ancient Greek phainesai, to show itself, which is loosely related to the etymology of folks, white. So um, we have this uh, notion of something coming into the light as not an appearance which is outside of the thing in itself. Phenomenology transcends the duality of an appearance which is not the thing. Instead, just let the thing show itself. But of course, showing itself requires something of a metaphor, at least etymologically it does, of, of light, coming into light. Therefore, 
the logos half of phenomenology is not just the modern logical notion of a judgment, which connects two things and affirms or denies, right? Um, the connects a subject and a predicate, right? It's rather making manifest, but logos makes manifest in speech what is being talked about, and therefore still has something of an, of, of, of an inclusion of this notion of bringing into light. Of course, this notion of deconcealment coming out of concealment. Um, still has this leftover of what remains concealed. And it's not this or that thing, it's the being of beings. And therefore, the emphasis not on this or that thing coming out of obscurity, but rather in this book about being, being something that we can gain greater, uh, we can try to reawaken the question of, is going to show that phenomenology is not a method. Uh, excuse me, phenomenology is not so much uh, a question about the content of the phenomenon as it is a question of the methodology or the how. And of course, in ideas, Husserl goes to um, impressively technical great length about how phenomenological methodology differs from, say, ax axiomatic geometrical methodology. It differs from natural scientific um, empiricist descriptive methodology. Phenomenology is, it's, is a unique methodology which you simply cannot even subordinate to well-established sciences like mathematics. Um, but phenomenology does still have a content, although it's more a method or how with regard to the things themselves, its content is the being of beings and therefore phenomenology is ontology and therefore the disclosure of beings um, does give you something of a transcendental in that Dasein's transcendental is its priority to all other things. And therefore, whereas for Kant, the transcendental is this type of anonymous static form of any object whatsoever, any object whatsoever is going to be quantitative, qualitative, relational modality, some instantiation of those categories um, occurring within these fixed coordinates of space and time. Of course, we're um, higher by focusing on rather than an a priori have the transcendentals does on its priority to the set of all other things rather than more traditional notions of that. So I'm going to go ahead and check the live stream now. The reason I typically don't check it too early is because um, you can generate a nasty sort of feedback from the microphone if you do that. Uh, so it looks like nobody, okay, so Adam, hey Adam, great, uh, great to see you, thanks for watching, very nice, uh, thanks for um, uh, participating uh, tomorrow. Daniel and I resume the discussion of being in time by jumping all the way to head to chapter three. That was kind of Adam or Daniel's um, choice. I, I'm letting him lead the discussion he wants. So I'm going to be jumping ahead, not discussing this section so much as the third chapter on the world. I really am looking forward to doing a section by section analysis of this whole book. Um, as I, I didn't want to just do like a super quick like overview of the whole book, although that might be another video for another time. So anyway, thank you all for watching.